So for those unfamiliar with the topic, I'm going to be diving right into sort of how we even begin to go about thinking about how these exploits work. Um, but first, let me define it and just say that a, uh, the type of browser exploit we're talking about today is when you are using a browser, uh, someone who may be able to give your browser JavaScript, such as a website where you might load scripts from the web page, uh, will be trying to exploit the browser's protections and gain code execution on your computer, which is to say, take over, essentially take over your computer. Um, and so this is this, the, the sort of threat model here is that you are trusting, say, a website not to exploit your computer, uh, but you will download JavaScript from, the, from, say, a website and run it. You know, usually JavaScript does nice things like, uh, you know, make the buttons flash and make the, 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 the games run and other sort of web, dynamic web content type stuff, but it can also do some very nasty things, which we will get into. So this is just a fun quote for uh, those of you who may have heard of some of the systems involved. Um, Microsoft uh, has made the wonderful performance decision to run their, uh, uh, basically the JavaScript that Edge is running runs with system privileges. And so, you know, downloading code off the internet and running it with full system access, what could possibly go wrong? Uh, and then this is just a bit of context in terms of how many, what, what are called CVEs, which is essentially a categorized vulnerability, have occurred in some of the more popular browsers. Now, you'll note that Chrome is like way, way below everyone else, and it's because Go a team at Google called Project Zero ends up finding most of these bugs, so they're not gonna like report it externally just to report it to themselves. Um, but it is fair to say that uh, Chrome's is much, uh, is likely much lower, uh, although potentially not six, you know, not that low compared to the others. Um, but this is crazy. These are, uh, these are remote code execution vulnerabilities, meaning that, say, a website would be able to fully take over your computer, run whatever applications, run whatever code they wanted to uh, on, your, on your laptop or whatever you're using to browse the internet, which is absolutely insane. So I've sort of mentioned this already, but uh, the key to exploiting browsers is JavaScript. This gives us the dynamic, uh, the, 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 uh, it basically gives us code that we can run in a target's browser, uh, rather than like HTML and CSS, which are rendered, but generally more static. You know, it's, it's, you're describing how a layout might look, whereas JavaScript gives us, uh, gives us some flexibility in terms of we can run code in, in say, a target's browser. Um, and some of you may be thinking, ooh, I've heard of XSS. Yeah, what's up? As a side note, <laughs> uh, has uh, there been any like big cases of markup being used to exploit a browser? A little bit, uh, especially in terms of how long it takes to render something, which is really interesting because you know when like a link turns purple after you've clicked it. Ooh, I was bad like that. That is a that is a uh, a layer that is applied uh, after it's loaded, um, and so it actually takes ever so slightly longer to render. So you can tell if someone has clicked a link by loading it into your page a bajillion times and averaging if it takes slightly longer than loading other links into the page. But that's a different attack. It's also neat, but, uh, but yeah. So this is not, this is just to clarify again, this is not cross-site scripting. This is not uh, attacking another website via a user's browser. This is actually attacking the user themselves. Um, so there's a bunch of steps that are gonna be involved. One of my favorite to depict <laughs> is escaping the JavaScript sandbox. And we'll get into that a little bit later, but I really just wanted to put this picture on this slide. <laughs> um, so before we get to escaping the sandbox, uh, how does this JavaScript work? Um, so most of the time, it's going to download JavaScript from a web, set, web page, say, and it's going to basically read the code and run it. Uh, and if you want to learn more about that, I would highly recommend uh, Computer Science 430, <laughs> taught by Dr. Keene and Dr. Clements, um, both of whom are amazing professors and can teach you all about how that works. Uh, for us, we're going to be talking about the security of, of this system. Um, you may have heard of same origin policy, which going back to cross-site scripting, we're not really looking at that security stack, if you will. We are looking more at um, what happens on the application. We're trying to exploit the browser, which is an application running in the application sandbox, which I'll get into later. Um, and so often what these browsers are doing is they're pulling JavaScript down from a website and then and running it and you know, making it do whatever it does to the web page that you've just loaded. 
Um, but browsers want to do this really fast because they want users to have like a really great experience, and you want to be like, wow, you know, Chrome makes this run ten bajillion times faster than Firefox. Um, and so what browsers are doing is they are going, well, JavaScript is great. It's this it's this high level language that lets us do all sorts of neat transformations to the web page, but because it's high level, and some of you may be familiar with like Python is another high level programming language, which lets you do a lot of cool stuff in not very much syntax, but it also means it's much slower than a language like C or assembly. Um, and so what the browser is going to do is it's going to say, okay, instead of just running that JavaScript code, I'm going to translate it into basically machine code, uh, uh, assembled assembly. So these are just bytes um, that will run much, much faster than interpreting the JavaScript, which is you know text, you know the, the, the text of the code being parsed and interpreted dynamically. Instead, what it's going to do is basically compile it and run the compiled code instead. And uh, you know sometimes it will see an opportunity to do this, especially when uh, you have to say a function in a while loop. It's like oh that's going to run a bunch of times. We'll essentially compile it and it'll be able to run way faster. Uh, and that is called JIT compilation, or just-in-time compilation, because we're doing it sort of on the fly, uh, just in time for the code to be executed, it will be compiled. Um, and as I mentioned, the, the security model we're going to be thinking about is this application sandbox. But how, more about how JIT works. Um, there are various libraries that do this. V8 is the one that's baked into Chrome. B3 is the renaming of FTL, blah, 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 which is the one baked into Safari. Um, those are mostly just if you want to Google them later. Uh, and there are others, but those are really the two big ones. Uh, and they are across the board written in C++. Um, and there's some reasons for that that we'll get into. But uh, it lets us write large projects that, that run quickly because the, at the end of the day, the goal of this whole process is to make things run faster. And as I said, it takes JavaScript and then compiles it to machine code so that uh, can be run much, much more quickly. And the major issue uh, across the board with all of these libraries like B, uh, V8, B3, is that they use what's called a read, write, execute page. So normally your operating system will say, hey, this, this is, these are some bytes. This is a page. Uh, it's some number of bytes. And you are allowed to write data there. Uh, like, let's say, like, here's a, a cat picture, cat.jpg. And you can write that there. And then later, and that's a write. And maybe later, some other process can read it if it has permission to access that. Um, that's cat.jpg. Um, this page, we would say, then has read and write privileges because the, the operating system will let processes read to it and write from it. Um, code, as many of you may know, is also data and uh, gets stored on, you know, on the disk in, in RAM, whatever, uh, and then gets executed by something like a process. Or you know, that's a whole thing. But we might say that uh, our code, which has been stored in a file somewhere, um, can be executed. And we say X because I guess E wasn't specific enough. Um, and the goal is to, a lot of uh, operating systems make this like a high priority, is to never have a page that is both writable and executable, and uh, with some exceptions. And the point of that is so that a process can't just write some code and then run it. Um, that should be something that requires a bit more privilege than just you know any application. Um, so what we don't want is we don't want our uh, our sort of processes where stuff uh, will be happening that's untrusted. For example, a browser which is downloading code from websites. We don't necessarily trust those websites, and so we're going to prevent it from writing to and executing the same uh, the same data. And so this is where the the, the problem of uh, just in time compilation becomes more clear, which is that. We basically need to do this in order for just-in-time compilation to work. We are taking that JavaScript code, we're compiling it and writing that somewhere, and then we immediately need to go execute it. And so we end up with uh, areas in memory that look like this, where we can uh, write to them and execute them. And generally, that's fine. Generally, we have something like V8, which is managing that, making sure nothing bad gets written to that page before we execute it. It's just making sure that just the JavaScript code we intended is being written there and then executed. 
Um, which, when we move forward, you'll see uh, is the, the, the sort of the weakest point for attack. We want to, as attackers, be able to write to that read, write, execute page such that we can then run whatever code we want instead of whatever code something like V8 wants. Um, and so I'm just going to go a little bit over a high level of like why JIT introduces these sorts of vulnerabilities. Um, the C++, C++ has objects, and they are very complicated things. So we're just kind of going to do a cursory, a cursory overview. So we define classes. Somebody may uh, maybe feel familiar with writing C++ or maybe Java. Java has some similarities to this model, but uh, it, it isn't exactly the same. This one is a little bit more uh, flexible. It lets us do more, more things. Java kind of protects you from some of the underlying complexity. Um, so we define classes, and maybe we have instances of those classes. Um, and when C++ uh, is doing this, what it'll do is it will create instances of those classes and store whatever fields or methods we want inside that instance. And so these will be pointers to the various uh, instances of objects. So a class might have a bunch of instances, or say here's, here's one. That instance might have its own fields and, and methods, so like a a class dog might have an instance Fido that has, you know, walk and, and how tall it is or whatever. Um, you know, this is, this is what you're familiar from, uh, with from like something like 102. Um, but yeah, sort of at a, at a higher level. And there's also this thing called a virtual method table. And that we don't really need to dive into what exactly that is. But essentially, it's a faster way to get to some of our methods. Um, if every time we want to say Fido should walk and we have to go find Fido and then go find its walk method, um, that's two hops. If instead we can just say, okay, well, we know Fido is a dog and we know where all dogs walk method is, we can just say, oh, here it is and do, do it in one hop. Um, and so for the whole class, this virtual method table lets us do that. It lets us take one hop instead of two. And as I mentioned before, the whole point of all of this is to make things faster. And so if we can do one you know, jump into memory instead of two, uh, that's, that's better. Um, and there's a bunch more there, but you know, that's, that's all right. We don't really need it for this. Um, so that's a pretty well-defined object model. It's, it's very complicated, but you know, that's all right. Uh, we can use whatever subset of it we want, and V8 uses a scary amount of it, but that's okay. So when we're, we're trying to take this JavaScript code and compile it into, a, into basically uh, assembly bytecode, um, so we have to have some sort of representation of like, okay, well, what are these JavaScript objects and what are, the, what are their essentially, what are their equivalents after that compilation? Um, which when we start having inconsistencies there uh, is where we can introduce vulnerabilities, introduce bugs. Uh, because we've got two really complicated systems and we're trying to make them basically interact. Um, so the JavaScript object model is, is a lot of fun. Uh, it has strings. Um, you can add those strings to numbers and those numbers will just become strings magically. Uh, you can also subtract numbers from them, but then that becomes not a number because, you know, of course it does. It also has dictionaries, uh, lots and lots of dictionaries. This is actually uh, uh, an array plus uh, an object which is pretty much a dictionary, uh, which is, of course, object. I don't know if that wasn't obvious to anyone. Um, and of course, you see this is addition. So naturally, if we flip it around, we should get the same thing, which, as you can see, we, uh, we do. Um, <laughs> so yeah, that, if, if anyone knows what's going on with that one, that's, that's awesome. We also have great stuff like keyword plus empty array is the string of the keyword. <laughs> what? <laughs> Uh, so this is, that's, that's like a little bit more justifiable, but, but it's not great. It's not great at all. Uh, that's, that's, that's something. And this is just, this is just madness. We have three ways to get to the same data, basically. We have this array dot prototype. Uh, we have an array instances underscore underscore proto because someone saw the way Python was doing it and was like, that's what I want. <laughs> And then we also have, oh, an array instance, we can, we can access it like a dictionary and say, oh, what is the underscore, underscore, proto, underscore, underscore? And it's like, oh, of course, that's the same thing as, yeah, anyway. Um, 
So then the question is like, okay, well, there's this complexity, there's, there's a lot of differences in C++ objects and JavaScript objects, but really how do we, like where is, where is what we're looking for in that? Um, and what we're looking for is these inconsistencies. And what that's going to look like is V8, you know, the, the thing taking the JavaScript code and, con and converting it, uh, thinking it knows where objects should be and us being able to sort of mess with that from the JavaScript. And that's because, like I said, they're so ill-defined up here and strictly defined out here to the point that security depends on it down here uh, that any inconsisten inconsistency can potentially be a vulnerability. Um, so as I said, the goal is going to be writing our exploit code to this read-write-execute page. Um, and the, the, at a very high level, the steps to do this are, okay, we'll create some sort of object in, in JavaScript, um, kind of mess with it. Uh, we're looking for things like that will let us do some sort of out-of-bounds write uh, because we're trying to essentially mess with the, the data in memory in, the, uh, in what will end up being the compiled code. Um, and I'll go into that deeper later. Uh, we want to get this code, we want to basically tr uh, force the browser to JIT this code. Because so we never get it JITted in the first place, we're just running in JavaScript land, we can't do much. Uh, but there are pretty deterministic ways to make this happen, especially like defining our own functions. Actually, uh, most browsers will just go ahead and JIT that right away, uh, because it assumes we're going to use it later on. Um, and so this is actually not as hard as it may sound. Um, and then we're going to try to figure out, we need, we need one pointer. So we're operating in JavaScript, which has no concept of pointers. We're going to need to figure out some location in memory to base where we're, where, basically where we're trying to go off of. And there are some tactics to do that that I'll get into later. But basically we're trying to figure out, okay, if I can write, if I can make the, uh, the JIT put this object here, and I know, where, I know that this exists somewhere, if I can figure out where, say, this location is, then I can probably figure out where the rest of it is relative to that. Uh, but if I don't know anything, if I just know that this is somewhere, I'm not going to be able to find it. If I can leak, usually you can leak like the beginning of an object uh, just because of the ways this, this ends up working. Um, and then you know, like, okay, well, I know generally how this should be laid out. So if I assume that the thing I'm looking for is here, then I can probably guess what this size is going to be and just take this number and add. Um, and so the goal is leak some pointer somewhere, you know, even if it's here. As long as we know that this offset is fixed, we'll be able to figure out where our stuff should be. Um, and what that will let us do is find a place. It'll help us find this, this uh, read, write, execute page. And once we can find it, we can write our shell code to it and then try to call into it. Um, and again, I'll get into the details of that a little bit later. Um, but that's the overall strategy. Basically try to set up memory like we are going to want it to be and then execute what we've, what we've put there. Uh, quick uh, overview of what shellcode actually ends up, uh, what it looks like. Um, this, might, this would be shellcode attempting to, I think that's in like uh, some Python script ended up being used, used for something. But um, shellcode is literally like compiled code. It is, those are, those are hexadecimal bytes, so those are you know, bytes. Um, but they are the translation of some assembly that we want to execute. So this is the type of data we're going to be writing to that read, write, execute page in order to, to take control of the, uh, the browser. Yeah? So how do they figure out which basic architecture to target with their shellcode? I can't just write anything I want. Mm -hmm. um, If you're writing an exploit that you want to use over and over again, yeah, just pick the most common one. JavaScript has a bunch of like uh, really nice APIs for like, hey, I'm Chrome on Mac version 10.11.6, um, just because it's uh, that's used for like website compatibility, and so that can be useful to for like figuring out what your target is running. Um, the, yeah, does that answer your question? Way of speaking, like, the actual architecture. Of your the actual architecture uh, like it says, like Windows, and you're kind of yeah, yeah. Um, not that I know of, but yeah. I, they, I don't think there's anything that can reliably leak the actual information. It will throw you some information, but 
Yeah, basically you have to make an educated guess at some point. Um, <laughs> yeah, that battery life one was no good. Um, all right, so let's uh, let's get into it. And this is gonna be we're gonna, we're gonna do a bit of a deep dive here, but that's that's all right. So here's some JavaScript code, and this JavaScript code was uh, put on the internet like two weeks ago uh, because it was in fact a zero day in, in modern Chrome. It was a it was a exploit that affected you know however many millions of users run Chrome, and uh, it was awesome. And I was reading about it, and it's really cool. So this is just a bit of setup. Uh, we're, we're gonna have some, uh, some objects. Uh, if you're unfamiliar with JavaScript syntax, uh, that's, not, that's not a problem. Um, we're, it's, this is gonna be a very high level. Uh, basically, we're defining a, some objects, which we'll deal with later, for now they're null, and we're defining a function, which we're sticking in the code variable. And by calling it, that's one of the, by sticking it in a variable and calling it, it's a great way to get that function uh, such that it will be jitted, um, just because we're going to want that to be in assembly for later. Um, so now the first kind of meat of this exploit. Uh, we have, we're, what the, uh, the author of this exploit found was a bug in the array uh, map function, which is a function, if you're unfamiliar, it's a function which takes uh, an array of stuff, let's say they're integers, and maybe we want to multiply all of these by two. We take map, we give it a function that we want to do to it, so like let's say mult by two, and then the array, and what it'll return is, you know, like two, four, six. It's super useful because it just takes this function, runs it on each thing, and then gives us back a new array. Um, you know, it's, it's often much easier than like a for loop. Um, and then we would have had to have defined multiply by two, which takes a number and returns it multiple by, multiplied by two. Um, so they found a bug in the implementation of how that is translated into assembly, which how they found is beyond me. Um, I guess lots of people have lots of time to spend code reviewing V8. Yeah. And that's gonna get straight into looping over all the elements of an array, which in JavaScript could be of arbitrary length, but when you put it into the actual machine code, there's like, you need a fixed length and you actually know the length before you start accessing all the elements. Exactly, the, the inconsistency will lie in something very similar to that. Uh, the other nice part is that JavaScript arrays can have holes, so they don't need to like be contiguously like, you don't, you don't need to have it be like one, two, three, four, five, you know, and every one of those locations has some data. They can be like, you know, you can have arrays or maps with integer b's. Exactly, you can have uh, data that's not just sequential, uh, because, like I said, everything is a dictionary. And so, you know, when you think like, oh, array zero in C, what this is doing is it's going to the location at an offset zero from this pointer. What in JavaScript it's doing is exactly what Kent said: is this is a dictionary from integers to the values, um, which basically means that this could be, that where this value is. Is JavaScript integer hash not just identity? No. Oh. But almost every language, integer hash is just the identity. Yeah. True. Why? <laughs> this is JavaScript. Why? So that you can have, uh, so you can organize portions of sparse arrays into different places in memory, because, I don't know, for reasons. Um, this is a language that was developed in 10 days in 1995. Uh, what we're doing here is we're, we've, we've read lots of V8 code and we've discovered that uh, it will trust what we say is essentially the length of the array. And so we're going to tell it when we ask, uh, when, when V8 asks for the length of this object, we're just going to say it's, it's one. Um, and we'll actually have more data than that but uh, this, this is exactly what I meant by introducing some sort of inconsistency. Uh, the V8, which is gonna be compiling this code, will think that the array is of length one. It'll only allocate one memory location for it. Uh, but in fact, in JavaScript world, we'll be able to access locations past just the first one and write into, uh, into memory where we weren't supposed to. Um, we've got uh, a, couple, a couple of, our, uh, of the variables we set up earlier used here. 
and they're being set up in a very specific way such that they line up in memory correctly. And I'll show you a bit of like what the memory layout looks like after this. Um, but yeah, basically we are setting up some arrays in memory. Um, and the goal is that it will look, end up looking like this. We ha will have uh, our objects from uh, lower to higher values as you move from the top left to the bottom right, sort of lined up next to each other just because, of the, because we read the V8 code and we know that this will happen. Uh, and there's a bit more complexity into making sure it happens this way, uh, which just involves not allocating too much space such that it spills over to different space. Um, but you know, that's just sort of an implementation detail for this attack. Um, the idea is that we're going to be able to access beyond the ends of our arrays like OOB RW there, uh, which, will, which stands for out of bounds read write uh, because the author was feeling documentative in variable names. Um, we'll, we'll, we'll be able to write off the ends of those into sort of the, the important structure of the other values. Um, and so, you know, if you're not catching the absolute details here, that's totally fine. This is like some memory bit twiddling magic. But um, the idea is that we've told the, uh, we've told the, the, the assembler that uh, this array is of length one, which means when we go 10 past it, uh, that's going to be some other object in memory. And because we, were, we know generally how things are lined up relative to each other, uh, that will let us rewrite specific values in, in memory. Um, so earlier we set up, uh, or right actually, here actually, we set up JS function adder to this thing somewhere out in memory, which we happen to know is a pointer to that code function we defined earlier. Um, and we know that just because of the relative positions of these things. Um, we're going to plop a, an offset to that code pointer uh, in somewhere that we can read and we, that we can modify and essentially just line up memory such that we end up having a function that was jitted. So the function will be have been plopped into our read write execute memory. Um, here's the, the assembled function. And what we're going to do is we're going to figure out where this is. And by figuring out where this is and getting right access to it, we can write our own code into these locations and then call that code function. And it'll jump right to the top of this and start executing whatever we've written there, which is crazy because these things are being assembled by essentially a black box. Like we don't know at runtime what is being put where, but just by reading the code of something like V8, we can try to figure this stuff out. And so like, this is a very involved exploit to develop, but uh, the payoff is awesome. The payoff is someone loads your web page with their browser and you get a shell on their computer. Um, and so exactly what I mentioned is we're, we're sort of, we're using this, this arbitrary read write uh, mis misunderstood array uh, and grabbing that pointer out of it and then just writing values. And that, those values will be the bytes of shell code that we want to execute. And then as you can see at the bottom there, there's a call to code because we happen to figure out where this is. And we've written our code there with all of those shell code 0 through 20. Um, and then by calling it, we jump right to it and the browser will just go ahead and execute it. Um, so like where, so what's the, what's the, what, what's sort of the point of that? What, what can we do from there? Um, part of what we can do is chain these exploits together. So this is like crazy. If you can pull off an exploit like this, uh, what you're essentially doing is having someone visit your web page with their browser, and then you're getting not only getting taking over their computer, but getting like system privileges, like root privileges on it. Um, and so what's commonly done is for something like mobile Safari or Safari is uh, this sort of framework that runs everything called WebKit is also connected to a component called IOKit, which runs as root. So the goal here is we're taking sort of the shortest path to something that's running in a privilege, uh, running privilege. So IOKit here runs as root. Uh, if we can find a bug in it and exploit it from the access that we've gotten, then we've gone from you loaded my web page to I have root on your computer. Um, similarly, in other browsers, uh, Windows, <laughs> Microsoft is a much shorter path because the JavaScript runtime is running privileged. Um, so there, there you go. <laughs> Wherever you are, you're there. <laughs> um, Chrome, on the other hand, does a really good job of mitigating this. This is part of why that number is so much lower. 
is that they have a crazy powerful application sandbox surrounding uh, when Chrome runs. And so once you've gotten to that point where you can, uh, where you can run, like for example, shell code, you then have to escape the sandbox, which is a whole nother challenge. Uh, and part of why Chrome is a really solid browser. Um, once you've done that, then you could try to do something like exploit WebKit or, uh, or take over the JS runtime. But because Chrome puts such like a, you know, these giant walls around what you can possibly do, uh, they end up with a lot fewer vulnerabilities. Um, this one's kind of fun because it's sort of the opposite end of the spectrum from Chrome is Firefox. You're not given, there's, there's not really that short path to something running privileged. And the reason for that is that Firefox just doesn't have these shiny things <laughs> that tries to make their code run faster. And you know, running something as root can give you some performance bonuses, but like, that's crazy. <laughs> Do not download code from the internet and run it as root. Um, and sort of obligatorily, uh, Chrome solves that problem on the, uh, the other way by having these really shiny, fast things, but also protecting them really well. Uh, yeah? You know what, if anything, in the Chrome like chain runs as root? In the Chrome chain, um, it really depends on what system it's running on. So like on a Unix system? On a Unix not system, much. probably not much. Uh, okay. um, just because there aren't really those like universally compatible APIs, like you know, when you're making a browser for the operating system that you're making, for example, with Safari to Mac OS or, or Edge to, to Microsoft or to Windows, um, they can make those systems work together really well. Um, so Chrome on like, you know, knowing that it has to run on every, op or, you know, any, basically every operating system yeah. uh, has a bit harder of a time to do, doing that. That said, there are probably some components in there that, that do maybe not interface with the rest of the operating system, but do some sort of, uh, of privilege execution. I think it has something to do with, actually it might just be their sandboxing. <laughs> um, so I, uh, I can't answer that question fully because I haven't looked into all of the, uh, say, Chromium source. But, um, but yeah. So we talked a little bit about this, but uh, you might be thinking, like, well, how do people end up finding these bugs? And one of the really big ways is fuzzing. And what this, uh, I gave a talk on this like last year, I think. Um, but what fuzzing is, is essentially throwing random data at things and seeing what happens in hopefully slightly smarter ways than just literally hucking data at it. You could try that. I don't, I don't know how, how that would work. Um, but fuzzing, fuzzing will let's find, let us find really unintuitive bugs. Bugs that like, why would anyone you know, input like a six and then, a, and then like a smiley emoji and then you know, the, the source code of the Linux kernel in that order. <laughs> and fuzzing is exactly for that type of stuff where it's like what, no one would ever think of this, but random garbage ended up finding it accidentally. Um, but as, uh, you know, as I say, this is in fact finding things sort of accidentally. You know, you're not really finding it by diving deep into the source code. You're just sort of seeing what happens. And if something explodes, you can be like, ooh, what was that? What caused that? And then try to figure it out from there. Um, but this is a really, really useful tool. And Google runs giant, uh, giant banks of servers that are just running uh, really, really state-of-the-art fuzzers. And if you can send them uh, a description of how their fuzzer should run, they will take that in, spin up some instances, start running with the profile that you created, and if it crashes Chrome, you'll just be sent money. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I think that will also be paid by a bug bounty. <laughs> Uh, yeah, the, the, the Google bug bounty program is awesome, um, especially when they run the fuzzers for you. Um, so I'd highly recommend submitting something to that just for fun. If you get like 50 bucks randomly in the future, you'll be like, hey, cool. <laughs> um, but then again, as I said, the other way that this happens is people just diving deep into the source code of something like V8 and figuring out how it works, which is a very sort of time intensive process, but can be very rewarding when you find a bug, for example, like uh, the one that we went over, which would theoretically let you exploit any of millions millions of people who are running a browser like, for example, Chrome. Uh, when one of these is found in something like mobile Safari, that's hundreds of millions of users that are potentially affected. And so that vulnerability 
ends up becoming you know like worth a lot. Uh, you know, Apple has a bug bunny program as of this year or last year. Uh, Google has always had a really really solid one, and so these end up becoming worth literal money uh, depending on whether you sell it responsibly or to you know some sort of black market in the Ukraine. Uh, but don't do that; that would suck. Um, and yeah, just lots. Lots and lots of time and lots and lots of luck. So I encourage everyone to uh, to go on a hunt, go on a hunt for the bugs. If you find uh, if you find some cool volumes, we'll uh, we'll turn them into exploits. And uh, thanks. I want to open it up for uh, for questions. Yeah. So I've heard of this thing called Servo. Okay. So what little I understand of Servo is that it is a rewrite of the rendering engine inside of Firefox in Rust. And Rust is a language with better memory safety guarantees than something like C or C++. And the goal of that is try to mitigate bugs which occur when you are dealing with like the untrusted data you might find on the internet. Um, yeah, does that answer your question? So it's a really neat project and Rust is a really neat language. Um, yeah, I'm sure Nick could tell you more about that, though. He, he likes his rust. Um, yeah, anything else? Also, this I don't know where I found this drawing, but I'm really <laughs> happy with it. <laughs> yeah? So you said that the bug, from my understanding, the bugs, the bugs come from <laughs> trying to convert JavaScript objects to C++ objects. Primarily, yeah, that's a, where a lot of them come from. But we said earlier that JavaScript objects are all just dictionaries, right? So Pretty much. Why don't we just convert everything to a hash map? Uh, because then it wouldn't really be a C++ object with all the nice benefits of like virtual method tables. Um, again, I'm not totally certain about the internals of something like V8. It okay. may do something similar to that, but there are enough edge cases that things like this can happen. Yeah. So that, yeah, um, that when run, you, you'd have to run uh, Chrome from the command line and run it with dash dash no sandbox. And if you did that, you would be able to like run a shell command. Um, their example was uh, it popped open uh, KDE's calculator program like Xcalc, um, which like when you visit a web page and an application randomly opens, you should probably quit your browser immediately. <laughs> um, <laughs> Uh, just some like uh, Andrew Garfield just smash the laptop over a table, yeah. Um, yeah, so that not with the notable exception of it was run with no sandbox. The Chrome sandbox will protect you from so crazy many things. Um, it's a really well engineered system. Uh, the team for which was headed by um, all of Parisa Tabriz. Uh, and Michael Zalewski at various points in history, which who are like two really, really famous people who I'd recommend Googling. I can actually I'll, I'll write those on the board. Um, Parisa Tabriz currently runs uh, Chrome. She's, she's the head of Chrome security. And Michael, I think that's right, Zalewski. Uh, Probably. Uh, <laughs> quite literally wrote the book on browser security, which is called The Tangled Web, which is very, it's relatively short, very dense, uh, really cool read, uh, but yes, it's, 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 it's dense. Um, so yeah, I would, I would Google these two. Uh, they've both done a lot of really, really awesome stuff with the money that Google has just thrown at them. Um, anything else? Yeah. I'm oh, sorry. CSS, uh, probably, I think probably somewhere in those like uh, timing related stacks. There also used to be a lot of interfaces in CSS to run dynamic content because IE7 was stupid. Um, you used to basically be, basically be able to embed code in your CSS selectors and that has been exploited pretty, pretty thoroughly. Um, yeah, no, it's, I don't know why it was set up that way, but yeah. Kyle, do you have something? So in 
Um, so the, uh, with a system like Safari on Mac OS, Safari is hooking, is not, the process itself is not running as root because as you say, you've run that process uh, and you are a user who's hopefully not running as root on your desktop. Um, <laughs> But it's hooking into APIs from systems that do. So something like uh, WebKit, which is doing the rendering for all of those you know, HTML, CSS, JavaScript that you've pulled down, is talking directly to IOKit so that it can really quickly draw things to the screen, for example. Um, and IOKit is running as root and is full of bugs and you know, is its own madness. Uh, similarly with something like Microsoft and Edge, it's not that the browser itself is running as root, but that it's very, very tightly integrated with systems that are. Um, and for Windows, the equivalent of root is system. Um, yeah, uh, did you have another thing? Oh, cool. By the way, uh, response. Uh, there is a DDE from 2010 uh, where Mozilla's uh, CSS font-based handling <laughs> caused an RCE. <laughs> oh, that's another big one. Yeah, it's that... Uh, Fonts are also processed uh, for the longest time. Were processed in the uh, in the kernel on Mac OS, which is like great. Of course they are. Uh, <laughs> when I want to render like a document, clearly what I want to do is have that be done as root. Um, Actually, it's not in the font. It's in how it handles the reference to an external font. Not necessarily. No, um, there's a specific CVE that. Oh, that specific CVE. Sure, sure. Um, yeah, there are, there are lots of different things that can be done wrong with fonts. Uh, Windows to this day runs that stuff in the kernel, which is just crazy. Um, anything else? Yeah. So you mentioned that the two ways these are found basically are fuzzing and code review, mm. but given that some of these browsers' code is not active. Uh, the open, browser, you mean? Or the browser with the code that is least likely to be accessible has the highest number of CVEs. Are you talking about Edge. Safari or, or Edge? I think Edge had the highest number. Oh, oh yeah. Both of those two, anyways. They had the highest number, and they had enough. Do, do people just fuzz the living fuck out of them or something? Both internally and externally. I'm sure there's a lot of fuzzing going on at... Uh, at Apple, and there is lots of fuzzing going on at Google, although Chrome is like half open source, which is to say that Chromium is an open source project that Google adopts and puts a bunch of closed source code on top of and then ships. Um, although I think in theory that closed source is mostly features above Node.js and just on That is the theory. Um, <laughs> there are a lot of uh, benchmarks of it rendering things way faster, which, which sort of hints that there might be more stuff somewhere in there, um, but I'm, I may not be up to, truly up to date on that. So your question was, can we trust closed source browsers, basically? I mean, I'd love to ask that question, too. Okay, so that's, that's a really interesting question, and it's really, at the end of the day, like most things in security, a trade-off, is do you want the like really shiny performance, like renders the web page super quickly, or do you want Maybe not audited source code, but the hope that someone at one point has au <laughs> probably audited this source code. That's the other problem is that like open source projects sort of gain this inherent trust uh, because like oh it's open source someone has looked at it, but like not have they? <laughs> um, you can never really be sure. Do they know what they're doing? Um, yeah, and you know it's, it's how many sets of eyes are required to find a sufficiently crazy bug? You know, like the systems that were able to were you know capable of programming these days, you know, using all of these frameworks are just hideously complex. And so really, when can we be sure that we don't have any of these kinds of bugs? Uh, the way these systems are currently defined, probably never. Um, but yeah, so it's, it's really, it's up to you. You have to, you have to decide if you want, you know, the nice features of Chrome or the, uh, you know, the neat stuff that Edge does in the kernel. Um, <laughs> It's really fast. It's really? it's just really really bad. Um, yeah. But yeah, no. So it's 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 a trade-off. Is is really the answer, which may be a little unsatisfying, but I'm sorry. Anything else? All right. There's nothing else. Thanks for uh, thanks for listening. <laughs>